Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you've all had a good week. So today, prepare yourself. This case is extreme. This could possibly be the worst case I've ever done. It's definitely one of the worst cases I've ever heard of. So prepare yourselves. Today, it's going to be a lot. Today, we're going to be talking about a team of serial killers. Mm -hmm. Not just one serial killer. There was actually four men, all of them serial killers, working together. I'm sorry, but is there anything else that is more terrifying than that? And these four men were known as the Chicago Ripper Crew. And just that name alone, you should know the kind of things that we're gonna get into today, but this crew is literally the stuff of nightmares. These four men would cruise around Chicago and they would target women, but they would target anyone. They would target people indiscriminately. They would literally snatch women off the streets before committing some of the most extreme violence sadistic acts I've ever heard of. And this went on for over a year. Bodies were just turning up left, right and center and these bodies were tortured beyond belief. Driving a red van, they grabbed victims right off the roads. Families were paralyzed with fear, hoping their loved ones wouldn't be next. Police found body after body across the Chicago area. The details are horrifying. This case is definitely up there with one of the worst cases that has happened to Chicago. And I mean the worst and I am I'm including John Wayne Gacy in that because John Wayne Gacy is also from Chicago and side note, John Wayne Gacy actually pops up in this story. Mm -hmm. Could it get any worse? And I really do need to give a disclaimer. I have to stress that this case is extreme. This is a lot. It's not going to be for everyone. If you don't like details about things, maybe skip this one. And please, for the love of God, do not eat during this video. Please, please, please listen to me. And don't say that I didn't warn you. So if you choose to eat, that's on you. I just want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, and that is Magellan TV. Now, Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service that has over 3,000 documentaries, and they have documentaries on pretty much every genre you can think of. There is history, science, travel, and true crime, of course. So just the other day, I was scrolling through Magellan TV looking for something to watch, and I came across the documentary Jonestown Paradise Lost, and I was like, oh, I found it, I know what I'm gonna watch. And I have watched so many documentaries, so much on Jim Jones and Jonestown, but it's just one of those cases that even though I've watched so much on it, it still fascinates me. The documentary Jonestown Paradise Last was amazing. It was one of those documentaries that's like half documentary, half dramatized. So it has those acting scenes throughout. And I do sometimes like those because I feel like those dramatized sections just really suck you into the story more. And this documentary really did have everything. It had real life footage of Jonestown. It had interviews with survivors of Jonestown. And it even had Jim Jones's son himself talking. If you don't know who Jim Jones is or Jonestown, well then you definitely need to go watch that documentary because that documentary will fill you in. But if you do know who Jim Jones is and Jonestown, and I'm sure most of you do because it's a pretty infamous case, well I still recommend watching that documentary because Jim Jones and Jonestown is just one of those cases that has so many layers. There's just so much to the story. And because it had those dramatized scenes, I just feel like it makes the story so much more horrifying because you can actually imagine it. It's just, yeah, Jim Jones. Wow, he was a piece of work. You can find Jonestown Paradise Last on Magellan TV right now. And Magellan TV is completely ad free and starts from as little as $4.99 a month. But best of all, Magellan TV are offering every single one of you watching right now one month completely free. No strings attached, no contracts, cancel at any time. They have so many documentaries. They have 3,000. You'll definitely be able to find something that you love. So go to the link in my description box and get your one month free or go to the link try.magellantv.com forward slash Danielle Kirsty. I just want to thank Magellan TV again for sponsoring this video, but thank you to every single one of you watching right now, because truly without all of you, I wouldn't get opportunities like this. And now let's jump into today's case, which is kind of a cult. Not really, but kind of a cult. So let's just jump in. So even though this case is about a team of serial killers, there are four serial killers in this case, we are only really going to be focusing and following the story of the leader of the group. Because even though they were all equally 
disgusting, sadistic, there was still a leader and he was a cult-like leader. So the leader of the group, his name was Robin Gecht and he was born on the 30th of November 1953, making him a Sagittarius. And he was born in Chicago, Illinois, where he grew up with his mom and dad and six other siblings. And side note about Chicago, this is actually our first time doing an actual case from Chicago. And I've wanted to do a case from Chicago for the longest time because Chicago actually has a very special place in my heart because it was where my mom was born. So I wanted to do a case from Chicago for the longest time and I'm really sorry to all of you that are from Chicago, live there now because I've possibly picked one of the worst cases. But yeah, anyway, back to the story. And unfortunately, not much is known about Robin's childhood, which is extremely frustrating because this is definitely one of the cases where I would have wanted to know what his childhood was like. But we do know a little bit of information and um, from what we do know we can definitely tell that yeah his childhood wasn't the best. He has simply been described as a problem child. He did not get on with his parents at all especially his mom. He definitely has mommy issues definitely 100% and that will become very very obvious when I talk about the types of crimes that he commits because obviously they're all against women but the kind of things that he does to the women as well definitely mommy issues. And at a very young age, he was sent to a school that was, quote, for troubled children whatever that means, and I don't know anything more than that. And not long after he was sent to this school, his parents actually kicked him out of the house and Robin was sent to live with his grandparents. And this is because allegedly, and I do wanna stress allegedly because it hasn't been proven or confirmed, his parents kicked him out because he allegedly molested his sister. And that is all I know. Don't know any more details than that. And even though it is allegedly I believe it, I do. And it's also rumored, there's a lot of rumors allegedly with this case, unfortunately. So it is also rumored that when Robin was a teenager, he formed a quote, close relationship with a pedophile. He even took a trip down to Florida with this pedophile. He was pretty close with the pedophile. I don't know if he genuinely was friends with this pedophile, maybe was inspired by this pedophile for what he goes on and does later on, or whether he was abused and a victim of this pedophile. I wish I could give you more context than that, but I, I can't. And those are the only details that we know of Robin's childhood and teenage years. But just the fact that he went to a troubled school, he didn't get on with his parents and his parents kicked him out for allegedly molesting his sister. And then all of a sudden he's friends with a pedophile. I think given all of that, we can definitely say that his childhood was not great, he wasn't in great environments and it was, it was definitely troubled. And then at the age of 16, Robin drops out of high school and gets a job. And that is all we know until he enters his adult years. So Robin is now 19 years old and he's living a relatively normal life, which I just find crazy because he's literally the most sadistic person ever. Robin found work in the construction industry. He was an electrical contractor. And this is when he started dating a young waitress called Rosemary. And within no time at all, it was very, very quickly, they were engaged and then married. And they soon went on to start a family and they ended up having three children. They ended up living just outside of Chicago and they had what was seen at the time as a very normal life. Neighbors described Robin as a relatively quiet person, very respectful. He went out, did his job, brought home the money. He was friendly. He was easy. He had the perfect little family and everything seemed normal, but of course it wasn't. Because what people around Robin didn't realize, what Robin's friends, family, neighbors, and even his wife at the time, none of them realized that Robin had an extremely dark side. Saying that Robin has a dark side is honestly an understatement. One thing that you should know about Robin is that he has been described as a master manipulator. And we are talking potential cult leader master manipulator, like that kind of level. And on top of all of this, Robin had another obsession and that was Satanism. And right now, out of the eyes of his neighbors, friends, family, and even his wife, Robin was building a satanic temple in his attic. And it's said that inside this secret room, Robin covered the walls 
in black and red inverted crosses. He built an altar for sacrifices and he would spend hours poring over satanic literature where he would read about sacrificial rituals, human mutilation, and also ancient torture practices. And it's thought that Robin became interested in satanic literature in his adolescence. And he was particularly drawn to the themes of domination and violence in these materials. And he became fascinated by cults and secret rituals and human sacrifice and having complete control over others. He then found this ritual in one of the literatures that he was pouring over. I don't know which one, but it particularly interested him and it was about the ritual of capturing a female victim, torturing them, and then removing their breasts to use as tobacco pouches. And when I read that, I was like freaked out anyway, but I was like, could they not have used something else for a tobacco pouch? Like, really? When I mean that Robin was obsessed with this, he was obsessed. This is definitely a very important thing that we are going to see throughout this whole case. And when he was reading about this ritual about torturing a woman and removing her breasts, etc., he became aroused, which no, Mm -mm, no, that is, no, no, no. And from this moment, Robin was consumed with the idea of capturing a woman and essentially torturing her and removing her breasts. And Robin was a student of basically torture and sacrifices and all of this violence. He devoured all of this literature. He consumed everything that he could about these torture practices. And whenever he would read about torturing people, causing them pain, he would feel aroused and he was developing some very sadistic dark fantasies. He is definitely a sexual sadist. And this is when he started to think, I don't want these to just be a fantasy anymore. I actually want to act these out. And this is where I have to give the warning for today's case. From here on out, it, it gets dark, it gets disturbing. I'm going to be talking about graphic detail of torture and other things. And it's not nice. So here is your warning now. If you're not prepared for that, maybe just leave because once you hear these things, you can never unhear them. And if you are eating, if you didn't listen to me in the intro, please pause this video, finish eating and then come back, please. So Robin had a particular obsession with what he described as large breasts. He even said, quote, it is a thing with my entire family going back to my great grandfather. Each of us men have married large breast women. And Robin's wife, Rosemary, started to notice that Robin was particularly fixated on her breasts and more than normal. Normal. But she told herself that, oh, it's normal, and she pushed it to the back of her mind and she tried not to think about it. But unfortunately for Rosemary, Robin didn't have a normal level of interest in breasts. Robin had what can only be described as a sadistic breast obsession. And remember that I said that Robin was becoming aroused by inflicting pain on others? Well, it wasn't long until Robin started to ask Rosemary to stick pins into her nipples during sex. And that satisfied Robin for a little while, but it didn't satisfy him for long because it wasn't too long until Robin was asking Rosemary to stick these large pins and push them into her breasts and leave them there all day. Like she had to go about her day with these pins sticking in her breasts. Honestly, no, oh no. And the fact that she had these pins in her breasts aroused Robin. The fact that she was just going about her day in pain aroused him. It even got to a point where these pins were causing infections, but Rosemary was not allowed to take these pins out. Instead, Robin gave her drugs to stop the infections turning septic. But this still wasn't enough for Robin. Rosemary wasn't satisfying him anymore, and it wasn't long until Robin started cheating on Rosemary. At first, he was going behind Rosemary's back cheating, and he was luring young girls, and I mean young girls girls. I don't know the exact ages, but they are reported as girls. So they're definitely young, possibly even underage. And he would lure these girls back to his home because obviously he's a master manipulator. And he would manipulate these girls into also having pins stuck in their breasts and in their nipples. And it's even thought and I'm really sorry because this is just truly disturbing. It's also thought that Robin tried to slice off one of the nipples 
of these girls and let's just call them victims because they are victims but oh my god he tried to slice off one of the nipples and honestly it just makes me go really funny when I read things like that and this case oh god it wasn't easy to research and it's definitely not easy to say and like I said Robin was taking advantage of these young girls and it's reported that around this time he actually raped a 15 year old and to make this even worse because how do you get worse than rape he raped this 15 year old in his own daughter's bed but somehow he managed to get away with all of this at some point rosemary did find out that he was cheating on her with various girls but she didn't mind she would actually talk to these other girls and talk to them about like the things that robin would do to them and rosemary is a victim as well let's not forget that robin's sexual fantasies and desires were getting weirder and weirder and more disturbing uh warning animal abuse skip 30 seconds if you don't want to hear it because there are rumors that robin had sex with rosemary's parents dog which no 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 and i think rosemary actually witnessed this happening and i just i have no words it is rumored i don't know if it's true or not i really hope to god that it's not true and as time went on rosemary demanded a divorce she wanted out and i do not blame her but no matter how many times she asked robin wouldn't allow her he essentially had her trapped and she stays married to him even though she doesn't want to be and she is married to him throughout the whole of this case, the rest of this case, even though she doesn't come up again in the story, she is there throughout all of the sadistic acts that Robin goes on and does. Already we have discussed some pretty disturbing things, but it gets worse, it gets much worse. So all of this very weird, disturbing sexual desires, fetishes were going on during the 1970s when Robin was in his 20s. And like I said, Robin to the outside world seemed normal more. no one knew about this apart from now his wife but there is one more very significant thing that happens to robin in his 20s that i haven't mentioned yet so remember that i said that robin worked in the construction industry now my true crime fanatics out there you may also know of another very infamous serial killer from chicago that was also in the construction industry and somehow unbelievably robin ended up working for that very infamous serial killer and who is that serial killer john wayne gacy you heard that right robin our cult-like leader of this group of serial killers worked for one of the worst serial killers ever john wayne gacy how in the universe is that even possible like seriously my mind was blown and i'm sure all of you know who john wayne gacy is but for those of you that don't he is the killer clown he is literally one of the worst serial killers ever he raped tortured and murdered at least 33 men and boys and he hid most of the bodies in his own home home and in 1971 john wayne gacy set up his own construction business called pdm contractors and john which i feel weird calling him just john hired a lot of young men and boys and most of the time he actually did this to kind of scout out his future victims but one of the young men that he employed was robin but not just that robin didn't just work for john wayne gacy robin actually worked on John Wayne Gacy's house. Which means that Robin, whether he knew it or not, we don't know, Robin was essentially digging the graves in the crawl spaces, under the garage, etc., for the victims of John Wayne Gacy. And there are even rumors, and I just wanna stress that they are rumors, this has not been confirmed, that Robin Gecht could have possibly been John Wayne Gacy's accomplice. Because there are a lot of rumors that John Wayne Gacy had an accomplice, John himself has even insinuated it at times. And it's definitely possible, it is. I mean, what are the chances that these two sadistic serial killers actually knew each other and worked for each other? But anyway, Robin worked for John Wayne Gacy through the 1970s. And this was the time where Robin was really developing his really sick, twisted fantasies. And then John Wayne Gacy was arrested, all of his crimes everything came out john wayne gacy and what he did shook the whole of the us it shook the whole world it was unbelievable what he did and just how many victims he had but to robin 
He saw John as kind of an idol. He looked at him and thought, oh my God, this is what I want to do. He obviously has a different preference and a different victim. And this is when he started to form his own ideas of what he wanted to do. Because Robin had always been obsessed with inflicting pain on others. And now he's found out that his ex-boss has inflicted pain on others and committed so many murders and got away with it for so long this was an inspiration to Robin and Robin devoured all of the news and the details of John Wayne Gacy's crimes and it's thought that this is when Robin himself decided that he wanted to be a serial killer and it literally just blows my mind that two of the worst that Chicago has ever seen Robin Gecht and John Wayne Gacy knew each other, worked together, and could possibly have committed murders together. Robin could have been his accomplice. And just as John Wayne Gacy has been arrested and put in prison, it's almost like Robin takes over because Chicago has been through years of terror at the hands of John Wayne Gacy. And now Chicago is going to be terrorized by Robin Gicked. So now he is starting to form his plans on how he's going to become a serial killer, what he wants to do, how he wants to go about it. And this is where we we get to the part of the story where Robin is not just the only serial killer in this story. This is when it turns into four serial killers. And it's not actually known why Robin didn't want to commit these murders on his own because obviously a lot of serial killers, I mean most serial killers, they act alone. But Robin was different. He wanted a group around him. It's almost like he wanted an audience. But I think he actually wanted a group of serial killers, a group of followers, so the followers could do the dirty work, do the things that he didn't want to do. Robin only wanted to do the really sadistic torture, the sexual torture. So this is when Robin Robin started to look for others and this is when essentially what would be known as the Chicago Ripper crew was formed. So I have mentioned this already but Robin is definitely a cult leader, potential cult leader. He essentially has all the skills that a cult leader would need. And this is when he starts to put them all to good use. Taking inspiration from John Wayne Gacy, Robin starts his own construction company. And obviously John Wayne Gacy used his construction business to lure young men and boys as potential victims. While Robin was using his construction business to lure potential fellow serial killers, which is just crazy that he is employing people and almost thinking, hmm, could you be my accomplice? Could you be a fellow serial killer? Do you have the same sadistic sexual desires as I do? And this is when he came across the three other members, Ed Spritzer, who was 19 years old, and then Andrew and Tommy Cocorellis, who were brothers, and they were 17 and 19 years old. And all three of these men, or should I say boys, because one of them was 17, they're teenagers. One of them is not even an adult yet. They are all pretty vulnerable. They are described as having below average intelligence. And they're also described as followers, as sheep, as someone that would follow a cult leader anywhere. They are the kind of people that are not the bully, but they enable the bully. All three of them were struggling in life. They didn't have jobs before and they didn't have anywhere to live. And then Robin employed them. So he gave them a job. He even let them stay in his house if they needed to. So all three of these men, Ed, Tommy and Andrew, almost felt like they owed Robin, that they would do anything to repay him because essentially Robin has given them a job, wages and a roof over their head. And this is when Robin started to slowly bring all all three under his influence. He realized that he had this power over them, that they would do anything to please him and he played on that. And as soon as Robin realized that they would literally do anything for him, he revealed his darkest secret and he took all three, Ed, Tommy and Andrew, into his satanic temple in the attic. Previously, this room had been forbidden to everyone, including his wife. His wife and obviously his children were not allowed in this room. Only Robin was allowed in this room. So the fact that Robin is bringing these other three people in this attic is a big deal. And Robin, once he's in the attic with the three others, he started telling them about his sexual desires, his fantasies, his dark fantasies. And it's actually unknown how the other three reacted to Robin telling them this. We don't know how they reacted. And I would have loved to have known how they reacted because did they want to murder themselves? Did they share the same fantasies and desires? Or were they just that much under Robin's spell that they just kind of went along with it. 
We don't know. But even though we don't know how they reacted to this news, we do know that they agreed to take part in Robin's fantasies because obviously they're called the Chicago River Crew. And it's just really crazy when you think about it that these four people came together and became serial killers together. What are the chances that Robin was able to find three other people that would be willing to take part in his sadistic fantasies. I mean, it doesn't exactly happen very often where you get a group of serial killers. I can't actually think of another case where it has happened. I'm sure that it has. And this is where I think this case differs from a traditional cult case. Because when you look up Chicago Ripper Crew, People have categorized the crew as a cult. You do see this kind of thing in cults, don't you? Where people are willing to do anything for a cult leader. But the Chicago Ripper crew feels different. It doesn't really feel like a cult to me. Even though the other three are not equal to Robin because Robin is obviously the leader, they are not brainwashed if that makes sense. They seem like three men that are willing to go along with what Robin wants them to, which is why I feel like it differs from a cult because cult followers are brainwashed. Yes, they will do anything for their cult leader, but they're brainwashed. And I don't feel like Ed, Andrew and Tommy are brainwashed in this case. And as you will find out as we go through the case, they are willing participants. They do just as much as Robin. It really is the stuff of nightmares that these four people found each other, came together and committed some of the most sadistic things I've ever, ever heard of. So now we get into May of 1981, and this is when the group want to commit their first murder. Late on the evening of the 23rd of May, 1981, Robin, Ed, Tommy, and Andrew climb into a red van, and they set off cruising on the streets of Chicago. At some point in the evening, they pull up next to 26-year-old Linda Sutton. Now, Linda was a mother of two, and she was just innocently walking down the street. And in a matter of seconds before she even knew about it, Robin jumped out of the van, grabbed Linda and dragged her inside of the van. She was then handcuffed and the group then drove to an unknown location. And this is when the group started to commit some of the most horrific sexual acts imaginable. One by one, all four men took it in turns to sexually assault Linda Sutton and Robin was directing the whole thing. And the sexual assault was gradually getting worse and worse with the group inflicting so much pain on Linda. They were torturing Linda. They were stabbing her. They were cutting her. They were doing everything that Robin had ever fantasized about. And this attack lasted for hours and Linda was kept awake throughout the whole thing so she could endure so much pain so Robin could see the pain in her eyes because at the end of the day, Robin gets off on pain. That is what he likes. But Robin was particularly focused on Linda's breasts. He drove a knife repeatedly into her chest until eventually by the end of the attack, Robin had completely amputated one of Linda's breasts. And then once the group had finished the attack, they just dumped Linda's body in a random field and she was just left there. And when they dumped her, she was still alive, but she eventually died from her injuries. She bled out. And once the group had abandoned Linda's body, all four returned to Robin's temple. And this is when Robin pulled out Linda's amputated left breast. He had kept the amputated breast. This was his trophy. And then the group started to masturbate onto the breast before eventually consuming the breast and eating it raw. And I honestly have no words. Like I said, this case contains some of the most disturbing things I've ever heard of. And I really wasn't being dramatic there. You can't even imagine, none of us can even imagine what Linda went through for hours she was put through that. So the group had just committed their first murder and unfortunately they don't get caught. A few days after the murder on the 1st of June, 1981, Linda's body was finally discovered. But it was found that because of Linda's breast amputation, parasites were able to get into the internal organs a lot quicker than they would have normally been able to, which meant that the body had decomposed at a rapid rate, a lot quicker than normal, and it had decomposed past the point of recognition. And it took weeks to actually identify Linda. And because of the state of the body, because of how badly decomposed it was, and obviously we've got to bear in mind that this is the 1980s at this point, the investigation came to a dead end. The police had no evidence, they just had a body. And this must have given the Chicago River Crew confidence that they could do this and get away with it. Because not long after the police discovered the body of Linda Sutton, 
more bodies started to pop up left, right, and center all over Chicago. And all of the bodies had one thing in common, and that was that they had a breast amputation. First, they discovered the body of an unidentified 35-year-old woman. She had been raped, tortured, and one of her breasts amputated. And still to this day, we don't know who this woman is. They then found another unidentified 19-year-old woman in a very similar state to the other body and Linda Sutton. She had also had one of her breasts amputated. And then not long after that, another unidentified body of a 40-year-old woman was found. She had been raped, stabbed, and strangled. And even though her breasts hadn't been amputated, they had been badly bitten and someone had masturbated all over her body. And again, I just have no words. All three of those bodies are unidentified women. We still to this day don't know who they are. And I feel like that just makes this 10 times worse that we don't know who these victims are. These victims had a life. They had family. They had friends, possibly children. And the police, when they were finding all of these bodies, they must have known that they had a serial killer on their hand because all of these women were found in a very similar state and all of them had the same MO. Their breast had been amputated or damaged. But because of how many injuries these bodies had, they were decomposing more rapidly than normal. So there was no evidence. There was no evidence linking the bodies together. There was no evidence to even suggest who could have done this. But obviously the police knew that this was the work of the same person because the similar MO. And because they had no idea, the murders continued. And by the time we get to the summer of 1982, the Chicago Ripper crew are in full swing right now. They committed their first murder approximately about a year ago. And the exact number of victims at this point is not known. Obviously, I listed a few of the unidentified victims, but some of the victims of the Chicago Ripper crew were never found. So we don't know exactly at this point how many people they've killed. And this is where we need to talk about the MO of the Chicago Ripper crew because they had a very specific routine that they would follow every single time. First of all, the crew would cruise the streets of Chicago in their red van and they would just cruise the streets until they found a victim and what is possibly the most terrifying thing is that this victim could be anyone. The crew only targeted women and Robin only had one requirement and that was quote a woman with sizable breasts. The group said that Robin did not stop talking about breasts like that is literally all he would talk about and it is the only thing that he cared about in the victim the only thing. More often than not, the victims would be sex workers because Robin saw them as easier targets. I mean, sex workers are incredibly vulnerable. They are a victim that is more likely to get into a car with a stranger, for example. But the group targeted women indiscriminately. Some of the women were marketing executives, estate agents, waitresses. The women were also different races and ages. The age range is actually huge. The youngest victim that we know of from the group is approximately aged 19 and then the oldest victim is in their 40s. The group really just targeted any woman that was alone on the streets. They also targeted women day and night as well. There wasn't a specific time that they would hunt and the attacks would be completely random. Sometimes all four members weren't even there for every attack. Sometimes it would just be two of the members. Sometimes it would just be three. Sometimes it would be all four. I do want to stress that it was always Robin that was there and all four of them. It's just absolutely crazy that they're all living normal lives. When they're not murdering, they all have families, they have jobs. I mean, Robin, we know, is married and he has three children and he brings his group back to his home all the time after they've done the murders. And I just can't help but think, where are the children? Like, what do they know? What do they see? I feel so sorry for Robin's children in all of this. I really do. I hope they weren't exposed to any of this. And once the group found their victim on the streets, because it was always Robin that said, yes, that is the victim that I want. As soon as they identified the victim, the group would stop the van. They would grab the victim, drag them into the van, usually handcuff them or restrain them in some kind of way, and then take the van to a secondary location. Sometimes it was Robin's home if his family weren't there. Sometimes it was a motel, but then sometimes they would just attack the woman, assault her and murder her in that van. That van was basically a mobile torture chamber. They had even removed the door handles from inside of the van so the victim would never be able to escape, even if they did break free of the handcuffs or restraints. This is literally stuff of nightmares. This is literally stuff from horror films. Robin would then read verses from the Satanic Bible as the other three members 
assaulted the women. They would gang rape and torture the women for hours. And this torture is so horrific. It's some of the worst things you can do to a human. The victims were stabbed multiple times, sliced from head to toe with various objects. Some of the weapons were makeshift weapons. Some of them were can openers, needles, razors, and ice picks. And the victim was alive during this whole torture. They were never allowed to pass out because Robin wanted to see them in pain because that is what got him aroused. And finally, the attack and torture would always end in the same way. Robin would amputate one or both of the breasts and he had a very specific way of doing this. He would take piano wire, wrapping it around the breast and pulling it tightly until the breast had been completely severed off. I mean, obviously we've talked about breasts being amputated already, but just knowing that he did it with a piano wire, oh no. I literally cannot think of anything worse. Oh no, but it gets worse which is like, how? How does it get worse than this? But after Robin amputated one or both of the breasts, he would attempt to have sex with the open wound on the woman's chest. And the other members would masturbate onto the severed breast. But that's not all, because then after the group were done with sexually assaulting the woman and obviously attempting to have sex with the open wound and masturbating onto the breast, they would then take the severed breast as part of their satanic ritual, which usually involved carving up the breast and consuming the breast raw. And then if any of the breast was left over, Robin would take the remaining breast and put it in a little box that he would put on his altar. And I still cannot wrap my head around the fact that it is four people doing this. Four men that are equally sadistic have all gotten together and are willing participants in this kind of thing. And whilst this is all going on, Robin is just leading a normal life. Remember that he owns a construction company, which he is running perfectly fine. He's still spending time with his wife and kids. He still goes to church on the weekend. It's like, seriously? But throughout, he's still committing all of these murders. And it really is crazy, isn't it, when serial killers, John Wayne Gacy is another really good example of it, they can just go around killing people in the most sadistic way and then have a perfectly normal family life, own businesses, be very successful. It's just crazy how people can compartmentalize the murders and just almost switch it on and off. But the murders kept on coming on the 15th of May, 1982. A woman named Lorraine Borowski was abducted outside of her work office. She was just crossing the parking lot on her own. She was repeatedly raped beaten, tortured, before having her breast amputated with a piano wire. She was then murdered with a hatchet before her body was then dumped in a nearby cemetery. And then just two weeks later, on the 29th of May, 1982, a woman called Shui Mack was walking home alone at half one in the morning. She had actually just gotten out of her brother's car after an argument, and she was just on the side of the road making her way home when the Chicago Ripper crew pulled up next to her. They abducted her and then took her to an isolated woodland area where they raped her, cut off her breasts, and quote, sliced her to ribbons before burying her body in a nearby construction site. And her body was cut from head to toe. She had lacerations all over. It's truly terrifying. I mean, obviously it's anybody's worst nightmare to be abducted, but to be abducted just from the side of the road, from the street, from outside of your work. Literally, nobody is safe right now. So now we get to June of 1982, and so far, every victim of the Chicago Ripper crew had been murdered. But that was all about to change. On the night of the 13th of June, a woman called Angel York was abducted from the side of the street. She was dragged into the back of the van and handcuffed before she could even process what was happening to her. The attack then proceeded the same way as every other victim. Victim, Angel was subjected to some of the worst sexual torture imaginable. However, this time Robin had a new tactic. He wanted to try out something new. He was bored of cutting off the women's breasts himself. This time, he wanted the victim to do it to themselves. Robin pulled out a sharp knife and looked Angel in the eye and said, I'll let you live if you do something for me first. He told Angel that the only way that she would survive this is if she amputated her own breast. Making the victim inflict pain on themselves is just another 
level of sick. Robin is bored of committing pain himself, watching his minions inflict pain. He now wants the victim to suffer even more and make the victim do something that is pretty much impossible. None of us can even imagine what Angel was feeling at that moment. She had already suffered through hours of this attack. She knew full well what these men were capable of. She had no doubt in her mind that they were also capable of murder. So Angel felt like she had no choice but to comply. She took the knife and her hand was shaking like crazy. And then she attempted to cut her own breast. She pierced the skin and blood appeared instantly at the wound. And in that moment, Robin became possessed. It's said that Robin went into a frantic frenzy. His instincts took over. He was so aroused that the victim was harming themselves. He couldn't wait any longer and he actually snatched the knife off Angel and plunged the knife into her chest himself. After he mutilated her breast, he then masturbated into her opened wound and ejaculated inside. After ejaculating into the wound, Robin took some duct tape and taped up the wound on Angel's breast. He then dumped her body in a nearby alleyway. And I feel like we all just need to take a breather after that because... <sighs> and we obviously know a lot more details about Angel's attack because she survived. Minutes after they had dumped Angel's body, a passerby spotted her. Immediately she was taken to the hospital and she survived. She was able to speak to the police and she was able to tell them that it wasn't just one attacker, it was four. And this was a huge revelation to the police because they were not looking for four serial killers. They were not looking for four attackers. They were looking for one serial killer. She was able to tell the police that they were driving a red van, but unfortunately, because the attack was so frenzied, she wasn't able to take in any more details and she couldn't tell the police anything else. So even though the police know that they are looking for four attackers now, not just one, and that they're driving a red van, they're still no closer to catching them. And I think what is just mind boggling about this case is how were they getting away with it? The police were looking for them. They were doing everything that they could. Bodies were being found straight away. But because of the wounds that were inflicted on the victims, because the breast had been amputated, the bodies were decomposing at a rapid rate, making it impossible to recover any evidence on the body. And obviously we are also in 1980, so forensic science hasn't exactly advanced yet. And and up until this point, the public were kept in the dark about these murders. The police didn't reveal the sadistic details of these murders. So the public were not aware that another serial killer or serial killers were at large because this was only two years after John Wayne Gacy had been sentenced. Police didn't want to create terror in Chicago all over again, especially just after John Wayne Gacy. But after the attack on Angel, details were finally being shared with the public and everyone was terrified. The media named the attackers the Chicago Ripper Crew. And as you can imagine, being a woman in Chicago at that time, you wouldn't want to leave your house. And this was in the early 80s, 1982 to be exact. And the satanic panic was sweeping America. A lot of it consisted of scare stories and false accusations. A lot of people were arrested on false accusations. And there is a whole history on it, which I do not have time to get into, but a lot of people were scared that Satan was basically infecting the minds of people. And it was coming from things like horror films and books and games such as Dungeons and Dragons. Black Sabbath was blamed. And obviously when the media were reporting about the Chicago Ripper crew, how they worship Satan and everything, um, it was definitely a perfect storm to create panic and terror in Chicago. But obviously in the case of the Chicago Ripper crew, people actually did have a justified reason to be terrified. People were finally becoming aware of the Chicago Ripper crew and Robin's three henchmen, Ed, Tommy, and Andrew, had started to become a little bit nervous. They were starting to get worried that they were gonna get caught, but Robin, 
he was still confident. He was still cocky. Robin was having none of it. He wanted to continue on with the murders and because he was the leader, the murders continued. And then at some point in August of 1982, 18 year old Sandra Delaware was abducted. Her hands were bound with shoelaces. She was thrown into the back of the van where she was repeatedly raped and beaten by the group. Robin then went on to amputate her left breast using piano wire. But horrifically, on top of all of this, he shoved a rock into her mouth to stop her screaming. And then he pushed a broken wine bottle inside of her, cutting all of her insides. He then proceeded to strangle her using her own bra until she tragically passed away. And then just two weeks later, Robin and his crew were at it again. They abducted 30-year-old marketing executive Rose Beck Davis. They just abducted her off the street and they carried out the same routine. However, this time it seems that the torture of Rose was even worse because when her body was found, a pool of dried blood lay beneath her anal cavity and her face was completely crushed beyond recognition. And I'll say it again, I know I'm a broken record, but I literally have no no words. This has to be one of the most sadistic cases I've ever come across. And as well, the sheer number of victims that we're talking about here and all of these victims were subjected to the most horrendous sadistic things. It's very easy when cases are this sadistic to almost not think that they're real because they do seem so far-fetched. They seem like a horror film. They seem like a nightmare. But all of this is true. Real people actually suffered through this. People suffered at the hands of Robin and his crew. And you might be thinking at this point, when does this end? Because it doesn't feel like it's gonna end, does it? But thankfully it does come to an end and that end is real soon. Because right now, Robin is becoming unhinged. He's literally going off the rails. He is losing control essentially and when killers, serial killers lose control, they get sloppy. Ed, Andrew and Tommy were becoming nervous. They were getting worried that they were going to get caught. But Robin, because he had lost control at this point, he wasn't really thinking about getting caught. He actually didn't really care. His personality, he feels invincible. He doesn't think that he's going to get caught and he wants to push the group further and further. And like I said, he became sloppy. He became too arrogant and cocky and this was his downfall. On the evening of the 6th of October, the group got in the van and they started driving around Chicago looking for their next victim. But after driving around for a couple of hours, Robin didn't find anyone and he was getting really frustrated. At this point, Robin had a thirst for blood and he needed a release right now. And it was at this point that Robin did something that he had never done before. He pulled the van over to the side of the road in a populated area and he pulled out a gun. Robin was now desperate. He wanted to murder anyone that he could come across. And unfortunately, this victim was 28-year-old Rafael Torado, his first male victim. Rafael had been standing in a phone booth when Robin opened fire. And tragically, Rafael died at the scene. And after, Robin just drove away. And honestly, this murder does not make sense to me. I mean, obviously they all don't, but this is completely different. This couldn't be further away from Robin's MO. First of all, he is using a gun, which he has never used before. The victim was male. He was shooting indiscriminately. He didn't really care who he shot. And this murder is not sexual in any way, which obviously every other murder has had an extreme sexual violent element. And it really does just tell you how much Robin has lost control. Robin is now like an addict and he's looking for his fix. And Raphael, unfortunately, was the victim. But Robin is not satisfied. I don't know if he's not satisfied because he wasn't able to carry out his normal routine, the victim was male, etc. because on the same evening, he continues to look for a victim. And as far as I'm aware, the crew never murdered more than one person in one day. Again, this shows how much he's losing control. This shows escalation. And unfortunately, Robin did find another victim on that evening. And this was 28-year-old Beverly Washington. Beverly was a sex worker and Robin approached her on the side of the road. And he even offered her more money than she was asking for. He is literally desperate to get Beverly into his van. And Beverly, at this time, she thought Robin was like a little bit dicey, but... He was offering her a lot of money, so she got in the van. Beverly was forced to strip at gunpoint before she was handcuffed and then sexually assaulted by all four men. However, her ordeal wasn't over yet because Robin forced Beverly 
to swallow a bunch of pills. Beverly started to sway and lose consciousness and the last thing she remembers seeing was Robin standing over her with a piano wire. And again, this is very different from his normal MO because normally he likes the victim to stay awake. He wants the victim to be in pain and he wants to see that pain in the victim's eyes. But right now he has given Beverly pills. I don't know what pills, but they've knocked her out. She is now unconscious. Robin is not gonna get that fix that he normally gets by seeing the fear and the pain in his victim's eyes. And once Beverly had passed out, Robin proceeded to amputate her breast. And then he just dumped her body on the side of some railroad track before driving off with her severed breast. Robin fully believed that Beverly was either dead or she would be dead very soon from her injuries. He thought that there was no way that she was gonna be able to survive her injuries, but miraculously, she did. Robin had become too cocky. Like I said, he was being sloppy. He was making mistakes. And Beverly survived and she was gonna make sure that Robin and the rest of the group paid for what they had done to her. On the 7th of October, 1982, a passerby spotted Beverly's body. She was covered head to toe in blood. Her breast was missing. I assume whoever found Beverly probably thought that she was dead, but she was rushed to hospital and the staff thought that there was no way that she was gonna be able to survive. But as we know, she did. She was a fighter. She was gonna survive this. And the police were able to immediately talk to Beverly, but Beverly was too injured and traumatized to actually talk to the police straight away. She literally couldn't form the words in her mouth. She couldn't even comprehend and process what had happened to her. But she somehow managed to communicate with the police. She actually would blink at the police for yes and no. And she was able to give the police the information that they needed. Beverly managed to confirm that her attackers were driving a red van. She was also able to write down some descriptions of what happened. And she was able to tell the police that in that red van, a string of feathers hung from the rear view mirror. And the police didn't know this information and this was a breakthrough. The police immediately put out an alert that they were looking for a red van with feathers hanging in the rear view mirror. And amazingly, this information was all the police needed to catch the Chicago Ripper crew. Because just two weeks after Beverly had given her descriptions, they found a van, a red van that matched the description. And the van was being driven by Ed Spritzer, one of the four members of the Chicago Ripper crew. And once they had Ed in custody, they put pressure on him and it wasn't long before he cracked. He soon gave up the identities of the other three members of the Chicago Ripper crew. So the police could finally bring the reign of terror of the Chicago Ripper crew to an end. But there was one huge problem. The police didn't actually have any evidence linking the four men to the murders. Obviously, Ed has given up the identities to the Chicago Ripper crew, but that is it. They don't actually know what to charge the four men with. First of all, Beverly Washington was able to identify Robin as her attacker. So at this point, the police could charge Robin for the attack on Beverly. But unbelievably, I cannot believe I'm saying this right now, but Robin was obviously arrested, charged, but then released on bail. It's like, really? What? Like, why is this person released on bail? He is a danger to the public. And when he was released on bail, he actually did try to attack another woman. It's like, seriously, this man is the leader of a group of serial killers, some of the most sadistic that Chicago has ever seen, and you're releasing him on bail. So whilst Robin is out on bail, ugh, they still have Ed in custody and they're really putting the pressure on Ed. They really need a confession from him. And the police tell Ed that the other three members of the crew are turning on Ed blaming everything on him. So the police need Ed to essentially give a confession. And amazingly, this tactic worked. Ed gave a 78 page confession detailing all the horrific crimes, murders that the Chicago Ripper crew carried out. And because of this, the police immediately arrested 
the other three members, they were able to re-arrest Robin, they were able to arrest Andrew and also Tommy. The police search Robin's house, they find the satanic temple and the police finally feel like they've got the Chicago Ripper crew, they finally have them. The investigation is essentially coming to an end but they were wrong because as soon as the police bring Robin into the station that Ed is being held in, Ed actually sees Robin and gets spooked and withdraws his confession. To which Robin then turned to the investigators and said, well, there you go, I'm innocent. And then the investigation just turned into a complete mess. The police had obviously arrested Andrew and Tommy, the brothers, and they managed to force a confession out of those two. And both of them did testify that Robin was the leader of the group. But now that Ed had withdrawn his confession, he was denying the whole thing. The stories from the four men were contradictory. They didn't add up. There was holes in the stories. And the police still had no hard evidence that Robin was a part of any of the murders, that he had anything to do with them. So they were not able to charge Robin with any of the murders, which is truly just mind-blowing. How is it that the leader of the group is not able to be charged with the murders? It's, oh my god, I can't believe it. So the cases went to trial and because Ed, Tommy and Andrew had all given confessions, their trials were pretty straightforward. Both Ed Spritzer and Andrew Cocorellis were sentenced to death. And Tommy Cocorellis managed to make a plea deal where he was only convicted for one murder, which meant that he avoided the death penalty and he was actually sentenced to 70 years. But then Robin went to trial and he was only able to be charged with one murder crime and that was the attack on Beverly Washington. So he was charged with attempted murder and sexual assault and it's honestly so frustrating that he wasn't charged with murder, at least one murder. And he was found guilty for the attack on Beverly and he was sentenced to 120 years. So then following the trial, finally the Chicago Ripper crew were off the streets and in prison. Even though it's so frustrating that they didn't get charged with all of the murders and it's so frustrating that Robin didn't even get charged with murder. In March of 1999, 17 years after he was arrested, Andrew Cocorales was executed by lethal injection. He actually became the last person in Illinois to be executed before the state abolished the death penalty. And Ed Spritzer was also sentenced to death, but his sentence was changed to life in prison. And then in 2019, after serving only half of his 70 year sentence, Tommy Cocorellis was released from prison. I know, I can't believe it. One member of the Chicago Ripper crew is out there. He has been released, which I can't believe it. Like literally, I cannot believe it. He's supposed to be serving 70 years. Why the hell is he out? Why is he living his life, walking the streets? And to this day, Robin Gecht continues to plead his innocence. Robin has continued to say that he is not a monster, that he is not sadistic, he was not part of the Chicago Ripper crew. And because he wasn't charged with any murders, there's a chance that he could be released in 2042 at the age of 89. That was the case of the Chicago Ripper crew. Oh my God. Again, I'm speechless. I have no words. I honestly don't know how this case doesn't have more coverage because it's not spoken about. I've only recently just found out about this case. This is such an incredibly unique case that you have four equally sadistic men come together and commit murder and become serial killers together. And to this day, we actually don't know the exact number of victims of the Chicago Ripper crew. Some of the victims were never found, but it's thought that the Chicago Ripper crew took the lives of 18 to 20 innocent people. And most of those people we still to this day don't know their identities, but we obviously do know the identities of some of their victims. Linda Sutton, a beloved mother of two, and she was only 26 years old. Lorraine Borowski, a beloved daughter, sister, aunt, and friend, and she was only 21 years old. Shri Mack, a beloved sister and daughter, was only 30 years old. Sandra Delaware, a beloved daughter, was only 18 years old. Rose Beck Davis, a beloved wife and daughter, 
was only 31 years old. Rafael Torado, a beloved son, was only 28 years old. So many lives were destroyed by the Chicago Ripper crew and my heart truly goes out to all of the friends and the family of the victims. My heart goes out to the victims that were never found, but my heart truly goes out to Angel and Beverly. I just really hope both of those women were able to get past what happened to them and find peace somehow. I have never come across a case quite like this and I truly hope that I never ever come across another case like this. As always, let me know your thoughts, theories and opinions and don't forget to leave me your case suggestions in the comments down below because I always want to know what you want to hear next. Thank you again to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video and I'll see you all in my next video. Bye. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Say bye bye. Say bye bye. Say bye bye. <laughs>